Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to move on then. Thank you very much for participating. There's still going to be some more as we go. So let's unpack this uh, a little bit more then. So, like I was saying, yes, the underlying issue here is futility. So when do risks become so high relative to chance of benefit that something shouldn't be done? So futile care is largely considered unethical, right? Because it exposes patients to risks without a meaningful chance of benefit. It's not uncommon, actually, occurring in an estimated 12% of all ICU admissions. It's very expensive. And interestingly, beyond that expense, providing care perceived as futile has been independently associated with burnout. So, you know, we like to think that what we do helps people. So feeling compelled to do something that's all risk and no benefit to another person can be quite morally distressing. The challenge, as I'm sure that we are coming up against that, is that it's, it's difficult to, um, <clears throat> it's pretty difficult to identify and avoid prospectively. You know, it, it's difficult to know whether that radio embolization or biliary drain would truly be futile before doing it or not. And despite people talking about this for decades, there's really not a single practical definition for clinical practice. So some people have definitely advocated for a more quantitative number, like 1%. Maybe if there's less than a 1% chance of benefit, that's futile. The problem is that clinicians, at least at this time, are not very good or accurate in our abilities to prognosticate and definitively determine that 1% chance. And even if we could, these assessments tend to be very qualitative and value-laden. So, you know, the concepts of a meaningful benefit or risk, what makes something worth it, can vary dramatically based on one's beliefs and culture. So it makes you think that maybe a single rigid definition is less helpful than a consistent approach that allows us to effectively navigate these cases on a case-by-case -case basis. So to approach this issue in radiology, what we started with was a systematic qualitative analysis where we interviewed a bunch of IRs and referring clinicians at different practices about how they make these assessments to look for common themes. And what we found was that IRs definitely do struggle with this issue, perhaps more so than other specialties due to the minimally invasive nature of their procedures, allowing those procedures to be done in more critically ill patients and making some people feel that, well, the complication rate is so low, so you might as well try it, right? It's kind of like the Hail Mary pass of healthcare. And this is further complicated by the fact that radiologists usually aren't that patient's primary physician who knows them best. So it's often a lot more work to say no than to just go ahead and do the procedure and move on. And when you really dig into those cases, I think that the perceptions of whether a case was potentially inappropriate or not tended to boil down to these four sets of factors that could come into conflict. And interestingly, even if a procedure was perceived as potentially inappropriate based on patient procedure and clinician factors, many describe still performing procedures due to these cultural factors, like not wanting to upset the referring team, fear of litigation or losing referrals, you know, local politics is a lot of the ways people would describe it. And on top of that, Radiologists described having little to no formal training or resources to really help them navigate these requests. So, you know, one solution might just be to provide that education in our training programs, particularly for areas like IR, where, you know, perhaps we need forms to not only discuss our heroic saves, but also the cases that we didn't or shouldn't have performed. However, that wouldn't necessarily address those cultural issues. So for that, I think you really need a consistent workflow that normalizes these discussions like people were indicating in their responses. So, you know, for example, there's quite a bit of literature suggesting that feeding tubes are not particularly helpful and perhaps even harmful in people with severe dementia. So what one private practice did was they teamed up with palliative care at their institution to get an institutional policy in place of not placing G-tubes in patients with severe dementia. But I think another more uh, flexible approach that we've been exploring is the use of advanced care planning prior to potentially palliative or risky procedures. So what advanced care planning is, is a formal assessment of patients and families' perceptions, values, and goals. And given the complexity and value-laden nature of differentiating palliative versus futile care, you'd hope that someone had had some sort of conversation with a patient about their values before getting that procedure near the end of life. And it ends up, there's actually good data showing that if that happens, it tends to improve satisfaction, reduce anxiety, and even reduce overall healthcare costs at the end of life. So then that was the question to ask is we took a look at 11,000 image guided procedures performed in a radiology department to see in cases where patients died shortly after their procedure, how often had they undergone some sort of goals of care discussion or 
palliative consult within three months prior to getting the procedure. And for inpatients, the answer was less than half the time, really closer to a third. For outpatients, much smaller percent of patients dying shortly after their procedure, because these are healthier patients, but also much less use of goals of care discussion or palliative consults to clarify those values and expectations. So I think one practical approach <clears throat> might be to trial workflow that has patients undergo advanced care planning prior to potentially palliative image guided procedures. Now, of course, that would require buy-in from referring services. So right now what we're doing is teaming up with radiology and palliative care at three institutions to try to trial a practical approach that fosters that buy-in and normalizes the use of advanced care planning to see if that would in fact improve end of life care while decreasing moral distress among people performing these procedures. Okay, so that was futility. Next case. So case two is you are studying a new protocol that could substantially increase diagnostic yield of those CT, abdomen, and pelvises from the ED for abdominal pain, but it makes the exam a little bit longer and increases radiation by about 50%. So the question is, what do you do to do this study? Do you integrate the workflow for all patients under an umbrella IRB? And for those that are unfamiliar, a lot of radiology departments will have an IRB in place that lets them change protocols without submitting a separate IRB. Do you add it to the general consent with the option to opt out? Do you recruit patients outright? So that'd be opting in to having this sort of scan when they have abdominal pain. Or do you ask your IRB for guidance? Probably sign up for some more paperwork. And again, with each of these, I'll you know draw people's attention to the to the top for those that just joined. To respond, you can either go on your web browser to polyub.com, or you can text to 22333. See, we're more split on this one. Still a lot going for C. C is going to be a lot more work, but maybe the right thing to do. You tell me. And just to say for these, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer with the idea of ethics. There's definitely ones that are, you know, better or worse, I'd say, like futility. I think there's some utility in that goals of care discussion, but it adds time, right? So that's the idea of trying to figure out a workflow to make that happen. Same with same with this idea as well. Oh, some people changed away from B, the opt out. Okay. I'll give it another few seconds here. It seems like C is really the winner. Maybe D is the other one. We want to ask the IRB for guidance. Okay. Okay, interesting. I think it's interesting because, uh, you know, that situation is obviously adapted a little bit from real life, but that situation has occurred a lot and it tends to be under umbrella IRBs. Doesn't necessarily make that the, the right thing just because it happens. Uh, Okay, cool. I think we got some pretty consistent, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep on moving on, moving on. Okay, so this case is really touching on right a large area of research ethics. And when I think about research ethics, I like to break it down into to two areas. So you have the ethics of data collection and the ethics of data interpretation and presentation. It's interesting in that research is something that many of us in healthcare are exposed to, especially in academics. So sometimes I think it's, it's easy to take for granted these kind of questions. And if you engage in research, you are required to complete these certain ethics training that I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with to ideally protect research subjects, the integrity of data. And a lot of that really grew out of World War II and some unethical experience performed in uh, concentration camps. But I think it's important to realize that there's been a long list of troubling research practices since then. And these are just some of the more famous examples in the last half, um, half a century or so. And if you look at data interpretation reporting, you know, surveys of researchers estimate that about 2% of people admit anonymously to fabricating and falsifying data themselves at some point, and say in 14% of the time that they know of colleagues doing this. Uh, when people have looked at disclosed conflicts of interest in research to publicly available payment information, people tend to find that about a third of authors for, mo for studies and then about 11% of guideline panelists fail to disclose relevant financial conflicts of interest. So that would be 
a financial relationship that might bias them in their opinion. Now, you know, I think that that's likely not with malicious intent and perhaps not even with conscious intent, but it does suggest that we have room to improve and could do better. And to do so, I think there's actually a few challenges to discuss here. So first, I think it's really easy for us to distance ourselves from egregious examples. So I think most people would most people would see injecting kids with disabilities with hepatitis B to see what happens with the course of the disease is wrong. But what about you know, exposing a large number of patients to a little extra radiation without their knowledge or consent? It probably shouldn't be thrown under that umbrella IRB, in my opinion, but you know, a separate consent process could seem kind of obstructive as well. So I think the point is that you know, these issues occur on a continuum, and it's only really the most outlandish that tend to get identified and publicized in retrospect. And additionally, when people have studied those, those outlandish cases, there often wasn't a single factor that led to that behavior. And the people involved were actually generally well-intended. So, you know, people tend not to wake up thinking that I'm going to do something terrible today. We all have conflicting interests and pressures to complete that next project or get that next publication or give that talk. And so in the moment, we may justify away behavior that we'd otherwise condemn. And it's actually common enough that it has a name that it's been described as bounded ethicality, that we have a, that we tend to be limited in our abilities to truly hold ourselves ethically accountable. But despite that, a lot of research ethics still relies on self-disclosure and self-management, which beyond bounded ethicality can create issues if we falsely equate disclosure with resolution, that once a potential issue has been disclosed, no further action is required. So then the question is, what can we do about it? I think, you know, first and foremost with research ethics, I think we really need to ask the right questions. So, for example, a common approach to conflicts of interest is to condemn them as inherently wrong. But, you know, we all have conflicting interests, financial and otherwise. Plus, the majority of research tends to arise from partnerships with industry, creating medical advances that might not have been possible otherwise. So I don't think it's necessarily practical or realistic to eliminate all of those relationships. You know, after all, I don't think it's so much the relationships themselves that are problematic, rather than what we feel here is really the potential bias that they can create. So perhaps the more productive conversation right now is, or question would be not how do we get rid of conflicts of interest, but how do we minimize bias associated with these beneficial relationships? Or how can one better identify and manage their own biases? And along that line, you know, perhaps more engaging education resources might be helpful, especially if we were to use that casuistic case-based approach with less sensational examples so that people might better see themselves in these examples. And so one of the things our team is doing is currently working to kind of distill current resources out there into a potentially more radiology-specific, more approachable resource. And then the last thing is, much like the futility discussion, it might be helpful to normalize a workflow where our colleagues can help us identify those ethical blind spots. So our approach to this is, you know, we're first collecting data on current research practices, because a lot of those numbers I was sharing you with you are from other specialties, not radiology. And then on top of that, we're going to perform a qualitative exploration of perceptions of conflicts of interest among radiology and industry partners to try and you know, create a roadmap for what that workflow might look like. Okay, case number three. So the third case is an 84-year-old lady that's referred to you, has lots of multiple comorbidities, including moderate to severe Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, she's had multiple recent admissions for aspiration and failure to thrive, and she's referred to you for hip aspiration. This is her most recent radiograph. A few more contexts. So when you go to meet her, she's with her daughter and she says, you know, she has good or bad days, the daughter says. And when you meet her, she says, I don't want this procedure. She has a living will from 10 years ago that says no invasive procedures. But like I said, her daughter's with her, who is her healthcare representative and medical power of attorney. And she says her mother is confused and the procedure needs to be done. So the question is then, do you go ahead and do the procedure like the daughter asks? Do you try and have a goals of care discussion in the moment with them? Do you ask ethics or palliative care for help? Or do you refuse to do the procedure because she's saying that I don't want the procedure? Okay, maybe, maybe we're a little split on this one. I like it. No one's gonna do the procedure, okay. 
Thank you for playing along, by the way, and responding. I really do appreciate it. I think it makes this a lot more interesting, uh, especially as an audience member to kind of see how our, our colleagues would respond to some of these questions in real time. Okay. I mean, I give it, you know, another 30 seconds or so for people to respond. And again, for those that, you know, have joined maybe a little later, we're doing these anonymous responses. There's instructions at the top on how you can provide your anonymous responses as well to these cases. Here another few seconds, see if we have some movement. So it looks like most people would reach out to ethics or palliative care. Um, it's interesting as a side, it's not part of this presentation, but we did a, um, we did a survey of a bunch of SIR members to see how often people had ever called an ethics consult or palliative care consult. And not often, um, I'd say palliative care is a lot more common than ethics. Very few people had called an ethics consult ever. Okay, awesome. So let's let's move on. I think we have some, some consistency here. So it seems like most people would reach out to that. Maybe some people, okay, so maybe you'd have the goals of care discussion yourself. And then some other people would say, you know, she's saying I don't want the procedure, so we shouldn't do it. Okay, great. This is good. I think I think I totally agree with with all of these responses <laughs> that, that people are indicating. Okay, so you know this case is obviously exploring uh, consent, also surrogate decision making. So ethically and legally, right? People get to decide what happens to their bodies, and if they can't speak for themselves, others can do so on their behalf. I think that consent is really interesting in that it's so common in healthcare that I think it's rarely thought about as an opportunity for quality improvement, despite quite a bit of literature suggesting that consent practices rarely live up to their theoretical ideal. So, For example, when people have asked patients how often they feel that they you know, got enough in information to make an informed decision, it's just about a little over half the time that we seem to be making that mark. And I think this is really because, uh, you know, quite a few people that we care for have a limited health literacy. Healthcare really is a foreign language, and the average reading level in the United States is about seventh grade. So as such, surveys of U.S. adults have shown that about a third of adults have low health literacy. So that's not even intermediate health literacy. And that number increases to nearly 60% in those over 65 years old. And now that's an important issue, not only ethically, but because miscommunication around a procedure is one, a common source for medical mistakes, but it's also one of the most reason, common reasons why people sue procedure lists. A lot of it boils down to, to miscommunication with their expectations. So I thought practically it might be helpful to briefly review some concepts that I've seen trip people up by being a, a fly on the wall as a resident. Um, to legally provide consent, right? One must be a certain age, often 18 in many states, but it varies or an emancipated minor, you have to have both capacity and competency to make a decision. And those two often kind of can get confused. So competency is not determined by us, right? But by a court, it is both definitive and global in that you either are legally competent to make a healthcare decision for yourself or a court has deemed you incompetent and has appointed you a legal guardian. Conversely, capacity is neither definitive nor global and can be determined by any qualified healthcare professional. So you don't need a site consult for your average capacity assessment. And when you think about capacity, I like to think that you should always be able to answer when and for what. So for example, let's say that someone gets really sick and is delirious. At that point in time, they might not have the capacity to make a complex decision about a risky procedure, but they might be able to decide what they wanna eat or what arm they'd prefer to have their IV in. A few days later, that same person might get better, and now they're able to make any healthcare decision on their own. So to assess capacity, your patient should be able to demonstrate to you that they, one, understand the situation, appreciate the risks, benefits, and alternatives to that decision, and then are able to convey a coherent reasoning for their decision. Note that it does not have to agree with your recommendation or necessarily be a decision that many other people would make. So in other words, people get to make bad decisions. Unfortunately, sometimes people assume that once someone has been incapacitated at some point or have a diagnosis like dementia or schizophrenia, that, that means that they can no longer make decisions on their own, which is not true. And finally, it's important to realize that 
surrogate decision making, such as having a power of attorney or healthcare representative, only really applies if that person cannot or doesn't want to make decisions for themselves. So I've had situations where someone's referred for a procedure and people immediately reach out to their power of attorney just because they have one, but that power of attorney is only there again if you've assessed the patient and they can't decide for themselves. It's important to realize there's many different types that vary from state to state and country to country, but for radiologists, I think the biggest thing is just knowing that this exists and that they're all really trying to serve the same purpose, which is to convey what someone would want if they can't speak for themselves. And then kind of as indicating some of our responses that, you know, ethics consults are there and great for those more complex cases. So I think that, you know, in that response, if the patient had capacity, then obviously she would trump her daughter. If, you know, you got into that conversation and she wasn't, it gets a little stickier because now a patient is saying, I don't want something and the daughter is saying to do it, even if they're confused. But we can talk about that more at the end if you're, if you're interested. Uh, but I want to talk about this, which is that I think the understanding of those differences that I just reviewed are helpful, but not necessarily going to improve consent practices on a large scale. So one proven intervention is using decision support aids, which are things like handouts or videos that present information on the risks, benefits, and alternatives of a healthcare decision at the average reading level, ideally in the person's native language. They've been repeatedly shown to increase understanding and satisfaction while decreasing uncertainty, inconsistent expectations, and even potentially lawsuits like we discussed earlier. However, I think the reason why they haven't really caught on in a large way is because previously the way they've been trialed increased to the amount of time that clinicians spent having those discussions, and it required them to add an extra step to their workflow. So both of those are not really great for sustained adoption, which is my theory of why they didn't really catch on very well. So what we did was, you know, decision, formal decision support aids didn't really exist for radiology, at least as far as we knew. So we partnered with a nonprofit organization called the Interventional Initiative to create decision support aids for image guided procedures with custom graphics that have been vetted by multiple radiologists across practice environments and diverse patient groups to try and make sure that we were they were meeting their mark and that they were conveying consistent information that people could understand. The difference from those past studies though, is that we're currently going to trial a workflow at a couple institutions where these are pushed to patients automatically before the clinician gets there to have the conversation. So the beauty of that approach is that you can theoretically improve consent without clinicians having to do anything differently. And some small pilot studies have shown that that workflow actually decreases the amount of time spent consenting patients while doing it better because most of the work has been done for you. Now, not everyone learns in the same way. So we're also working to make video versions as well and hope to start making these available to practices in about a year or so. Okay, last case. This is the, our AI case. So you develop a new artificial intelligence system for reading, screening, and follow-up CTs for cancer. Google is very interested in helping you, one, further develop the system, but also scale it. And on top of that, your institution is really interested in then incorporating it into clinical practice. But in order to do that, Google requires you to share thousands of patients' anonymized data with them in order so they can further develop it and scale it. Whoop. There we go. Okay, so the question is, do you go ahead and share the data? It's anonymized. Do you ask Google to agree to like certain safeguards that you think up, although maybe that could annoy them and threaten the offer? Do you ask your local IRB or ethics committee for guidance? But again, probably sign up for more paperwork. Okay, someone's confident on that one. Have your, or do you have your institution send a letter out to patients giving them the option to, to opt out of it? So it's almost like kind of reconsenting people to use this anonymous data. And again, for those joining, this is our, our last anonymous response question. But if you want to participate, instructions are up at the top, either with a web browser and go to pollev.com or text to 22333 to join, and then you can just text a response. So we'll give a little bit of time. Uh, this one definitely is not clear in that, uh, you know, our, the ethics of artificial intelligence is definitely a new and involving area. So. I think it's, it's interesting to see what people think about this. We have a little bit more time. Okay. 
No one's going for the safeguards. Okay. I guess if you want to threaten the offer, you might as well go all in with the IRB and ethics committee. Maybe that's what people are thinking. Okay, a little bit more time. Anyone else? No takers on B? Seems like we're kind of split, though, with the other ones about, you know, it's anonymized. Go ahead and share it. Do, do we kind of ask for guidance? Do we have our institution kind of let people opt out? That would be kind of a big ordeal, but maybe that's the right thing to do. Okay, any under the buzzer? Okay, great. So, so like I was saying, right, the ethics of artificial intelligence is definitely a new and evolving area. So there's a lot of opinion pieces out there, some potential frameworks that have been thrown out. I thought for the sake of discussion, I would go through one such uh, framework that was recently published in radiology by a mentor line, David Larson. And what they did was they proposed this potential framework for these questions where they viewed anonymized healthcare data as a public good. And so if it's a public good that, or I guess their reasoning was that since patients and clinicians had already used it for its intended purpose of diagnostics and now is anonymized, that that public good could be freely shared without recontacting people for their consent. But as a public good, then you couldn't sell it. So you wouldn't be able to sell that anonymized patient data to Google in any way. And you shouldn't only make it available to Google, then theoretically, if it's a public good, everyone should have access to these anonymized data sets if they're truly anonymized and safeguards are in place to ensure that. Along that line then, is that that differs then from the algorithm itself. So that algorithm that you developed, you should be able to have monetary gain from, or you or that company, because that is no longer a public good and is your intellectual property that you have contributed. So that's the way that they broke apart this framework. It's definitely still open to discussion. And if you're interested in that and being part of that discussion, uh, one thing that got started in 2019 was this Bold Air Conference or Summit, where they bring people from industry, law, ethics, and healthcare together to talk about the ethics of artificial intelligence and radiology. The second one was supposed to be at Stanford this year, but has been pushed back with the pandemic probably to next year. And the way that our group is hoping to contribute to it is that we're working to summarize those perceptions or per uh, those opinion pieces out there, because like I said, there's a lot out there. So summarizing that and then supplementing it with interviews with people from healthcare industry and also the general public to try and say, well, here's what, you know, maybe some experts are thinking about it. Here's what everyone else is thinking about it and try and find some common ground then about what the right thing to do would be. Okay, so that's all the cases with a little bit of unpacking for each of those four issues, but I wanted to make sure that I left enough time at the end so that one, we could talk about any questions that come up, but also talk about other ethical issues that might be on your mind, you know, like disability ethics, or if you wanna dig into conflicts of interest, I wanted to leave, you know, at least 10 minutes or so before concluding the session. So maybe first I can move over to the chat here. One second. Oh, that's my thank you slide for Dr. Haskell for inviting me so nicely. Okay, so does the interventional initiative have decision support aids in different languages? That is a great question. So far, only Spanish. So we got the, we paid a professional translator who's also a professor of Spanish to help us translate them into Spanish. Ideally, we hope to scale them to other languages as well, but at least for piloting them and trialing them out, the idea is to have an English and Spanish version, a uh, handout version for most procedures, and then for maybe some more complex elective things like prostate artery embolization or something like that, making sure that we have that video uh, supplement to it. That's great. What about what about other questions? Either on the things things that came up as we went, or Eric, other... what, how do you want to? Maybe you want to touch a bit on conflict of interest. It's obviously such a huge topic, but you know, we've all gotten to see the sort of the jaded or show our own jaded slides of disclosures at the beginning of every meeting that is supposed to just sort of bless a disclosure. But, I, you know, there's just sort of wash over you. And I don't really think that we both disclose in meaningful ways or that we may be as um, 
as as unbiased as we really think we are ourselves as investigators. Any any general framework for us to think about it in a more modern or effective fashion? I mean, I think the biggest thing is just what you were saying at the end of realizing that we're limited in our abilities. I think that's a huge first step that I think most people feel like, you know, I'm a smart, competent individual. I know what's going on. And that's that kind of bounded ethicality thing um, that I think having some sort of forum where you can ask your colleagues or just having the self-awareness to say like, you know, I'm kind of getting in this relationship or whatnot. I, you know, it makes sense to me, but maybe I can bounce it off of someone you know, that I feel confident talking about. It'd be nice if we could set up those sort of things. And so that's the idea of, of talking to people about it. Because our one of our initial ideas was like, well, what if there was a, a rating system? So rather than us just putting up those like disclosure sides, what if you gave like a one to five rating of how how much of a conflict of interest risk is there in this presentation? But that I think when I shared it with a lot of people that got shot down pretty quickly as being obstructive, which made me think that, well, I think that we need to kind of talk to a lot of people and try and get a consensus on this rather than just trying to pitch something and seeing what sticks. So that's where I'm at with it now. It's interesting because I have I have a set of disclosures in the JVIR as I, as I finally roll off in which you're required to indicate the scale mm. of your financial disclosure because I think less than $1,000 is very different than 30 or greater than 100. So there mm -hmm. are some points that sort of resonate with people, but I'd say just from the reading papers, it's very obvious how incredibly smart and successful investigators just write slightly differently when they're writing up a report of a sponsored trial when they've been the principal investigator. Yeah. And it's very hard to take it out of your head. It's yeah. Conscious. Well, I think one thing I was uh, musing with Dan Z about briefly was well, what if you were required to give your like public payment ID or something like that? You know how it's collected here in the United States. Would that like cognitively trigger something if you're required to write that down? I don't know if that's necessarily as helpful as a level like what you already have to an extent in JVIR. Um, I think that's the question. But I also think that, you know, there's a lot written about it. There's a lot of people kind of with that normative ethics response where people have thought about it ad nauseum, but I don't necessarily know if that's making any sort of effect. So I think taking a step back and figuring out how people interact with it would help us prove, do a better like workflow that might resonate with people better. Just, just, just for the contrary amusement, Tom Fogarty, one of the most successful inventors in, um, in medicine, um, his mm. first, I think, teenage invention was a motorcycle clutch. Um, once said at a meeting, no conflict, no interest, no innovation. <laughs> that was the other side. That sounds that sounds about right. Like, <laughs> um, oh, it looks like we had a suggestion of including the the statistics associated with you from the open payment as part of your disclosure side. You could. I think I think disclosure sides. I'm amazed at the, how long people put them up there. You know, I mean, it's less than a second usually, right? It's kind of like people, even if it's like full of stuff. It's kind of like, well, here are my disclosures and moving on and whatnot. It's PowerPoint roadkill is what it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so actually, I mean, I don't know if people caught it, but there wasn't a disclosure side in mind, which I, I did intentionally to see if anyone would ask me about it <laughs> or whatnot. Um, I don't have conflicts of interest necessarily related to this other than that I'm interested in it, but I am, you know, I took it out to see if it mattered to anyone. I, I'd love to hear from, from the attendees. Um, do these cases resonate for you when you think about them and the kinds of decisions that you've that you face day to day or think about projects and otherwise because they certainly speak to me um, beyond the interventional cases mm -hmm. um, how many attendings are speaking to um, your your students or your residents uh, in in the departments that are joining us from outside or or have actually thought I've had to think about one of these things myself mm -hmm. any voices out there and chat or otherwise Yeah, <clears throat> Todd Norton here. Um, I think, uh, you know, we come across these, uh, you know, from a di as a diagnostic radiologist. I mean, most of it is a question of whether to perform an exam when it's inappropriate. And just how much level are you going to dig into that inappropriate um, aspect of it? And at what point are you going to just say, you know what, just do the exam? 
And so I think we run into that infrequently. And so the question becomes is, you know, some of it is you appreciate the the ethical problem, whether you're, you know, whether it's a question of misuse of resources or whether this patient doesn't really need this in your opinion. But there's also the aspect of are you going to get backup from this if you make this decision? If you kind of, you know, make your referring physician upset, um, is that going to come back and, and bite you? And so there's, I think there's a political aspect to it also. I think, uh, you know, um, Eric touched on that a little bit uh, in saying about, how, you know, how that could, could be. I'm sure a lot of people have experienced this. I know a lot of residents have. I mean, they're on the forefront answering these questions. And a lot of times they're like, this doesn't seem right. But, you know, particularly in the middle of the night when it's a resident telling an ED attending that they don't think the, the study is appropriate or necessary. It's kind of a hard, you know, you're, you got a, a little bit of a hierarchy there that makes it difficult to do the right thing. Pat, I had this this very weekend on call with one of our residents in which once we resolved the issue, which was to spend hours trying to help people make a decision not for us to do something, we talked about the fact that it was far, far more work to get that consensus and not do something for that patient, which we know is a good, than to have simply gone ahead with something that would have reduced her quality of life and would have been reasonably acceptable. But all that work to create a different plan um, disappeared. Nobody is aware of it. There's no, um, our, our only satisfaction in our own, and it could have gone politically different. So uh, how, how do you build support in the department, either consensus or faculty or otherwise, to allow people to make the kind of decisions that you described? Yeah. Yeah, it came up actually all the time in interviews, more so in academics, actually, than private practice is that people felt like, well, I say no, but then they're just going to call my division head and someone else is just going to do it anyways. So, like, why am I fighting this this battle unless, like, do I really want to die on this hill, essentially, is what a lot of people would say. And I, I think it's tough. And that's why that was actually one of the most surprising things from that study was that even if everything else you would perceive it as potentially inappropriate, and maybe sometimes you do put in that effort over the weekend to do it. But a lot of times you are like, hey, you know, there's definitely been times where I just I just do it, right? I just do the G2. By the time that I argue with everyone, I could have just done it. Um, and that's why it pushed us more to the workflow ideas that, well, you have to you have to get buy-in then from other things and establish some sort of workflow where it takes that burden off of that individual in the moment. Because there's there's no way practically you can empower people to do that on the regular. Um, hi everyone, I'm Michelle from Schneider from University of Michigan. Thank you so much for the discussion. Oh. It, it's it. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Sorry. Um, I agree that it's at, at least from my experience, I find it's very attending specific as in terms of what ends up happening with patients, and I think in order for change. Yeah. Be made, it has to be a culture shift. If the entire institution and the department is known to be um, very focused on making sure what's right for the patient instead of just doing procedures and cranking out for whatever the other departments want, I think then it'll just by default be known that there's going to be a discussion about what's right for the patient. It's not just going to be a for sure this procedure is going to be done no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually one of the beauties of those um, advanced care planning things is actually like a formal document that you put in the chart saying like, here's the patient's values and expectations and the sort of procedures and things that they want. So it just gives you a little more backup to say, rather than like you go and talk to the patient and then the referring team's like, well, I talked to them earlier and they definitely wanted it. It's like, well, I <laughs> okay. It's, it's easier <laughs> to think about in children but in adults, when you start to think about uh, annual exposure and getting to doses that are, you know, to the, the 50 millisieverts of uh, your radiation worker, um, there, there, there's a lot of inertia to reaching out and finding a decision maker and saying, you know, maybe you don't need to get this extra CT scan for this person. Things that you think about in IRBs, but we don't have the support to make those diagnostic uh, inquiries. Because yeah. it was sort of viewed as a as an externality, as a utility, and as light switches are always there to be flipped at request and um, as a service. 
Yeah. No, a hundred percent. And I mean, it goes back to the cultural thing, which is why, like, you know, before the ethics stuff, why I was so interested in the interspecialty cultural dynamics and how do you engage people? And that's why like the specialist, the specific thing is that if you want to engage the emergency department about their CT ordering, it's not really helpful to take a radiology approach to that conversation because that's not the culture and where they're coming from. So having that understanding lets you then approach the conversation in a way that's actually going to resonate with them. Uh, and so I think with all these interventions, you kind of have to start there. And that's why it's like that bottom up approach is like, if our thing is like, we feel like radio, the ED orders too many CTs, the first step should be going and talking to the ED about their perception of ordering CTs. So maybe the new Zoom culture of education is the opportunity to try to create these events because You'll yeah. never get these physical groups in the same place for events that don't emerge from their own specialty anyways. People just want to swim in their own tribe, but maybe this is the cross-cultural way to do this experiment. It sounds like your next uh, experiment. <laughs> well, it sounds, it sounds good to me. You know, the qualitative person in me is already like, my ears are perking up, so. <laughs> uh, what, any, any other thoughts or discussion too, or else I can... I mean, close. I just had some thank yous to say at the end. But... I do think uh, this is uh, fantastic work, Eric. I so very much uh, appreciate it. And I think uh, education, uh, certainly uh, developing workflows that support this as well, I think is very important. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I think as we've seen in medicine, it's just that the incentives are so perverse that mm -hmm. until we get to realign some of the incentives, um, it, it it gets uh, very difficult to be able to change uh, the culture or the practice. Um, but but you have, uh, you've enlisted our support in fighting the good fight. So thank you so much uh, for leading this charge. I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the support. That's actually my program director, by the way. So I have a lot of support from him and him letting me spend time doing these things <laughs> so um, eric as uh, we want to respect everybody's time coming up and yep. we have two minutes left and um I, I don't know that everybody knows but you are in fact a dir resident that you are this accomplished at this stage so it's very exciting to me to think about what you're going to be doing next when you get the full mantle of your half a day a week of academic time as a faculty person amidst all your clinical duties, I know that you all overcome that. Speaking on behalf of the department and Dr. Matsumoto, the chair of the department and my partners in putting this together, I'm so happy that you've done this. And uh, I hope we can reach out to you again for another variation of this because I think the, the interest is enormous. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, that's actually my, my last two slides was one, thanking you and the University of Virginia for putting this on and inviting me. And the other thing is that, you know, as maybe you mentioned, is that we're actually a working group, right? Like, so we actually have faculty and trainees across the board that are doing all these things along with our society support. So please feel free, anyone to reach out whenever about whatever. And thank you again.